Welcome back to Understanding VC. I'm your host Rahul. Understanding VC is a perpetual MBA on a single subject, venture capital. Today I'll be having an in-depth conversation on optical computing with Dennis Kalanen. Dennis is an Asia Business Development Manager at Runa Capital, a global VC firm investing in early stage tech companies and focusing on fintech, deep tech, B2B SaaS, digital health and edutech. And prior to joining Runa, Dennis managed an investment project in China and also co-founded a startup that helps high tech companies enter the Chinese market. Let's talk to him. Hi, Dennis. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, me today. Hi, Rahul. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So, you know, I was reading about optical computing and then uh, I didn't realize this. I didn't realize that there is a potential for optical uh, processors uh, to operate at terahertz or, you know, petahertz speeds. That's like an order of magnitude faster than what we have right now. And the, the one alternate computing platform that I've looked into briefly on the podcast as well as quantum computing. And I feel like optical computing is more promising and more ahead in terms of like technology maturity. Well, um, optical computing is kind of maybe, maybe considered as a more short term in terms of the promise that, and, and the commercial traction that it has. But of course, what would be more impactful is still a question mark, I, either quantum or photonics or optical computing, because both topics are really large and they actually solve a bit different problems. Uh, optical computing is mostly focused on solving deficit of compute power and energy efficiency problems, so while quantum computing really focuses on um, solving the problems that were impossible to be solved previously, like the end body problem, like uh, the salesman problem, because it uses quantum mechanic principles and essentially make a lot of sophisticated challenges, not exponential, but linear, because due to quantum effects, they can perform multiple calculations at once in parallel. And that's why quantum is really good for solving extremely sophisticated optimization problems or another uh, quite promising uh, use case for quantum is quantum simulations like creating a very complicated digital twins for example for manufacturing i can i can dig deeper into some uh, of the use case of portfolio companies but essentially that's quantum and op uh, optical computing is focused on basically doing the same as the classic computing does, like as GPU, as NVIDIA's GPUs do, uh, do, but just way more faster and way more efficient. So that's that's the difference in, in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So other than, so this is essentially a different way of computing, right? The classical computing is electrons and this yes. is like light. So would love to know more about the, the basics of photonic computing and also like why has this become so important for now because you've been talking about the potential of photonic computing for a long time yeah yeah sure well first of all a small disclaimer because i'm not a physicist so i may probably so there may be some more technical people and scientists could explain it more accurate but from the vc perspective as a as a VC investor, I, I would explain it uh, as the following. So traditionally, the compute has been done by, use, by using electrons. And electrons are, on one hand, they're quite uh, useful for transmitting and uh, data and uh, making the computations, but they have several problems. One of the problems is that they do not travel as fast as we like them to, to travel. And the second problem is that they interact with a lot of other materials, like, for example, when they are transmitted through cables or just being uh, used in, in a chip. And that creates losses. And we've seen a similar situation of ele electronics being replaced by optics in data transmission, like in uh, copper cables, which were all around and were used by networking companies just some 30, 20 years ago. And now almost all the data transmission is done by optical fiber, 
fiber. And this, this is for exactly these two reasons. Light travels way faster than electrons. Light is the fastest matter that can move with the highest speed. And the light do does not interact with other materials as electrons. So this basically makes optics um, a viable alternative to um, electronics. And that's what happened in data transmission area. And um, if we even look at the history, it's even interesting that comparing the history of electronics and history of optics, optics is following electronics by like around 50, 50 years back with a, with a 50 year, a year's lag because the first Fleming valves were invented in like 19, um, 1904. And the, the first research on optics was in, in the sixties. And then the first amplifier, like the, 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 the first electronic transistor was made by Bell Labs in the later forties while the optical amplifier, which basically kind of has similar function, can be compared with transistors, was invented in, and implemented in 1980s, in the 1980s. And it kind of, by following the trend of data transmission, we can project and forecast that the same will happen in the compute space as well. Uh, we saw the first microprocessor by, by Intel in the, in the 80s, um, around 80s. And basically, we think that in uh, five to 10 years, we may see a viable replacement of the compute, like the, the viable um, implementation of new compute architectures based on optics. So this is, this is how we see the history, and this is how uh, I think we can draw some parallels why optics can be good architecture for compute. Yeah, interesting. So in terms of transmission, it's it's already like, like a fully mature technology. Yeah. Almost everywhere, even the, the internet, uh, we use optical fibers. But for compute, what was the challenges in terms of not being able to make progress. So, so. The, per the first technology and the first attempts to do the compute based on photonics was in the space called silicon photonics, um, like light matter, light intelligence, and some other companies attempted to do it and still are trying to uh, implement it. It's basically uh, using both photo uh, optical technology, but also the traditional CMOS architecture for silicon, trying to kind of connect them together, basically to implement the interconnects between chips in, um, as photonics, like for fiber for, for photonics architecture. And uh, it worked to a certain extent, but the biggest challenge is that uh, you, as transistors become smaller and smaller, optics cannot basically keep up with this Space because the ability to mini miniaturize the optic uh, architecture is just very limited for, for the reason that the wavelength of light is larger than the wavelength of electrons. That's why you just, you, you just cannot uh, make uh, chips or interconnects based on light as small as for electrons. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest problem. That's the biggest bottleneck that silicon photonics is experiencing currently. And it's, I would say the problem is uh, hasn't solved yet with, for this particular stack, for this particular kind of technology. And that's why kind of maybe also getting a little bit ahead. We as Runa Capital, we haven't invested in this space. Really, although we looked also in a lot of companies in integrated photonics and in silicon photonics space, and we made a bet on the so-called the new wave of optical computing, which I may also share a little bit. But that's not that's not silicon photonics. That's that's for sure. Okay, so so you can make a, a photonic compute. That is one way, and, and the other way is 
you know, you don't, you still operate with the silicon mm-hmm. compute, but then all this interconnection can be photonic, right? So I was listening to uh, another interview by the CEO of uh, Light Matter, and he, I think they are more focused on this interconnect between compute. And he has this argument that uh, a lot of compute, even now, with, with for, for a lot of AI applications are not being fully utilized because the data transfer between the different compute instances uh, is so slow. So a lot of time the usage is like very minimal, five to ten percent or something like that. And yeah, that that's why the focus is there. Um, yeah, so, this so is basically you... well, light matter. As far as I know, they started from uh, making uh, integrated photonic chips for um, AI applications. So it was a bit of a different uh, area. And then they pivoted towards uh, optical interconnection chip, uh, which is uh, quite an interesting area as well. We invested in, in a company called Enlitra. It's, it's a company out of Switzerland, and they basically developed a multicolor laser, which is uh, like you have a um, light source, and then you split the laser into 100 parallel light beams by the technology called frequency comb. And uh, then you allow to perform the calculations through every single beam by increasing. And, and this is how you increase the efficiency by 100 times for, for data transmission. And this is, I would say, it's, it's, um, it's focused on the similar use case, on similar application as light matter, because they also target data centers. And, uh, but the technology is different. Like they, they also use one of the architectures also using conic chips, but the main IP and the main kind of the technology stack is laser itself and how it transmits the data for data centers. Um, so this technology is quite interesting. They've been already tested by NTT, the, the Japanese telco, which also is looking at conic space quite actively due to very huge strategic interest. They're one of the largest data center operators in the world and also providers of equipment for data centers. So that's an interesting one in interconnect and uh, kind of uh, data transmission. But it's uh, still, that's one segment, I would say. And uh, uh, if we talk about the market, um, it's still limited, like it's growing quite fast because the um, data centers are increasingly becoming a bottleneck in terms of like how effectively you transmit the data, how much data you have, like the, in general, the amount of data is growing um, rapidly and will grow even more, uh, even faster in the next 10 to 20 years. And that's why the market like is growing, for, is growing from like several dozens of millions right now only to several billions in the next five or 10 years. So it, it's still interesting play, but that's, I would say quite limited in some point. Okay. So uh, there is interconnect and then, so what are the other segments and where are the op- other opportunities? I think there is one is the photonic processors. Yeah. Compute sort of well, uh, technology. Basically there, well, um, photonics ha- uh, has a lot of different segments. Like photonics is a, is a huge industry. And uh, like one of the applications is LiDAR, for example, for um, basically generating like uh, 3D objects based on the sensors and it's used for autonomous vehicles, for example, which we haven't touched yet, but that's one segment. Then there are many other applications, like some applications are even used in healthcare, like one startup in the UK is using it for um, improving the function of uh, healthcare device called, called OCT device, which is optical coherence tomography for scanning um, eyes. And they use photonics as well to make the, this technology more efficient. This is like all the, all the, different, all the different applications which are not necessarily connected with computer at all. Um, but if we talk about optical computing, uh, that's where the market is growing right now and that's a huge market that we will see will reach like several hundred billion dollars and there we 
kind of see two major approaches. One is analog computing, uh, computing for specific applications, mostly AI due to very rapid growth yeah. and generative AI and um, a lot of demand for AI training, AI inference, and then digital computing. And digital computing is something which is ex extremely sophisticated to implement for the reasons that I just mentioned when I was talking about photonic uh, chips. And they're, they're just, you, we think that it needs to be implemented in a different way, not by using chips, but basically creating like the full, fully optical uh, processors. They're using only, only optical components. And this is extremely sophisticated because it's hard to recreate the whole infrastructure, uh, the whole architecture based only on photonics. Like you have many different challenges that I think, well, I, uh, it does make sense to go really deep into them in, in detail. But so far, there are no companies that done it successfully. We invested in one early stage company out of Germany, which is currently attempting to do this. And we think that they have quite good chances because their the IP in this space is really strong. And they have, well, they're very close to having a prototype, but it's still, it's still very early. Um, and this is, but essentially, if they succeed or if any other companies in this space, in this segment succeed, this technology may potentially replace the, the course like the CPUs of our PCs that we, uh, that, we, that we use every day. And this market is huge. This market is like so far it's $200, $300 billion, but it will be growing, of course, uh, very rapidly because what the promise of this technology is that it can increase the clock speed, like the, basically the speed of processing units by like 100 times. And this, of course, yeah. for such mass mass market application of species is a, is a huge number. Uh, it's, it's a very significant improvement. Um, but this is, a, I would say, it's still very early. Uh, on the other hand, if we talk about analog computing, which uh, has different applications, but we specifically look at AI-related applications. We invested in one company called uh, Lumai out of Oxford. They do what light matter and light intelligence tried to do in the beginning, uh, but they use a different technology. They, they basically said that we think that integrated photonic chips is not a viable um, tech stack, it's not a viable architecture because it's really hard to scale photonics on a, such a small size transistors uh, on the 2D uh, dimension. That's why they basically uh, abandoned the, the whole idea of chips and decided to make processors. And processors basically like a, it's a box that sits on the rack at data centers and uses the so-called free space optics or 3D optics where light travels basically inside this box freely and, and, and you basically encode the information in the, in the photons inside this processor. And then you can do like the mat uh, mat matrix multiplication, the inference. And this is application very is very suitable for AI specifically because like you need to, for inference, you need to just do a, lot, a huge number of uh, similar, almost identical uh, calculations. And that's why I think that's, that at least this is the technology that we think might be viable. It's still very early, like the, they have the prototype, but it's still like a few years before the first, the first commercial applications. But the upside is huge. It's the total addressable markets, again, is three, four hundred billion dollars. And it will be growing because a lot of tech companies, but also like data center operators will need to process and train uh, a lot of data for AI, for LLMs. And this is, of course, it's not 
a component that will sit somewhere in, the, in your PC, but it will be the essential part of most of the data centers, which are using huge amount of data for training AI. So I think that uh, we think that this market is huge and the application of, uh, for these optical processors which is, is just enormous. Okay. Um, just to confirm, Lumai is still using the traditional transistors, but with photo. No, no, they're using, they don't use chips. They use, it, it looks like a box, like a shoe, shoe box. And it's called, okay. oh, you can, okay. you can call it optical processor. Okay, it's a, so it's just yeah nothing to do with they, the take silicon, the silicon photon, uh, photonic chips and kind of just put it aside and to a device that yeah. will sit on the rack. It will be uh, still an essential part of the architecture. It will be connected maybe to other GPUs, through the classic GPUs in the data center with the, all the modulators and uh, photo detectors like transceivers. Um, it will, but it it will perform, like it will be focused only on AI training. Yeah. And uh, you guys have also invested in this company, Acatonics, right? Acatonics is, is exactly the company that develops the digital optical computing. Yeah, the one that potentially may replace um, uh, the core of PC and PCs if they succeed to reach the commercial scale. Like a processor? Sort yeah, of optical processor, but, but logical Similarly. gates and uh, all the all the digital capabilities that will not be confined within a single use case. Like Lumai, for example, does for AI on the AI, but Acatonics will potentially be able to just compute any kind of any kind of calculations just way faster, just same as CPUs do for our PC. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, why is uh, like optical computing important now? Uh, I kind of feel that uh, because of the way AI is progressing, the traditional sort of uh, silicon-based computing is going to really hit a wall, and we need this. Yeah. Basically, there are two major opportunities which may result in. Like there, there are two major challenges which may uh, be turned into very huge opportunities, like trillion dollar opportunities. The first challenge is that the amount of data is growing. I think one of the forecasts is that by 2050, the amount of data that we consume every year will grow by 500 times. It's if you if you may think of it, it's it's insane actually. It's similar as the amount of data that we're consuming now, and then you take like the Stone Age, that's how much data we consume back then. So in in 25, like 20, 27 years, we will con consume so much data that it will be just another, yeah, it, it, it will be another level of uh, um, how we may imagine like the whole world functions. And of course, this amount of data cannot be processed, cannot be stored, cannot be transmitted to the current infrastructure. Like, well, I, uh, we've even uh, did um, uh, like a thought experiment of trying to, uh, to imagine how many data centers you would need to construct. And it's basically, you, uh, if you just build data centers for this amount of uh, data, you will basically cover the whole Swiss lab or the whole Switzerland will be like in data centers only. And then comes another problem that data centers are actually quite, um, they're quite power consuming. And again, different forecasts, some forecasts uh, say that data centers consume like 4% of the global po uh, power. Uh, some say even close to 10 or even 12%. And the global emissions is like, pretty much similar numbers. And you may imagine how much more emissions will be created because of this. And uh, that's not a huge, huge problem that may be here. And uh, um, this is on one hand. And on, on the other hand, Moore's law is kind of breaking. So the, uh, 
the size of transistors is approaching an atomic scale, and then you have to deal with quantum effects. You can either try to somehow fight with them, uh, supp suppress them, uh, you may, or you may think of a different architecture. Because so far what we see on the market is that the only solution is just, yeah, we just increase the number of transistors. That's all. And uh, that would work to a certain extent. But, and, but we already can see that the, like the graph of uh, number of transistors on a single chip is kind of was linear, but, then, but now it actually is accelerating. And it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem because the supply of compute power will not grow as fast as demand. There was, demand. There was a paper by yeah. um, OpenAI uh, forecasting that the demand only for AI training will grow. The, 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 dem the demand for data used for AI training will double every three to four months, which is, uh, there was another article then demystifying this saying that maybe not three to four, but it's still, it's very significant difference. And then apart from AI, you also have streaming, which is another thing. And then edge devices, which maybe are still not that big of a segment, but it will grow. And self-driving cars. Yes, exactly. <laughs> autonomous, uh, autonomous vehicles, one of them. And again, if we, if, if we, take the horizon of 20, uh, 20, 30 years, that would be, yeah, that would be a huge challenge with such amount of data. And uh, that's basically the whole rationale. Another thing why now is that now we really see the progress in optics and materials that enabled um, um, companies, startups to uh, solve this problem on the engineering level and just because of the demand, because of the problem, we see a much stronger willingness of corporates, for example, of large tech companies to invest more money into this, to support this research. We see a lot of government funding into this space, a lot of grants, which kind of, it's a combination, but I think that pretty much answers the question why now. Yeah, yeah. And um, so the the major sort of impact that such a breakthrough in optical computing would have is obviously on AI. And then you also mentioned about things like self-driving cars. Anything in particular, I, I think if you can have a completely different uh, compute uh, sort of platform, it is going to have effect on everything, but uh, the, the majority of it uh, would be in a specific industry. Like if yes, uh, what would be those industries? Um... Or use use cases. That's the thing that for photonics, that, that's probably because because we haven't discussed quantum. Uh, I, I, I we usually tend to uh, discuss quantum together with photonics, uh, but um, yeah, I think probably just kind of um, getting a bit ahead. Um, in con uh, in contrast to photo well, quantum, where you have like specific industries, like a multiple of them, but they still will like they have a limited uh, number of industries that would benefit from quantum in photonics, like everything that will, that uses compute will benefit because yeah, you can, um, every industry uses computers, every industry will now use AI and essentially photonics is, is an infrastructure, a next generation infrastructure that will solve the bottlenecks for faster compute for for faster training and uh, for, again, for energy efficiency. So I would say the beauty of photonics is that it's kind of universal. It's not like it will help companies in pharmaceutical space and pharmacy, but it will not help in fintech. It will help everyone because it's a universal infrastructure. Uh, I guess another way of looking at it is like this technology will be pushed to uh, like make it real, the, the push to make it real would be like a lot harder because of the breakthrough in AI. Uh, it's one of the factors that drives the demand, but there are all major other factors like streaming, for example, remote work, which are on the demand side and on the supply side is again, the new combination of materials 
um, the new technology of lasers, also several factors that enabled, like for example, companies like Invitro to manipulate light in such a sophisticated form and create those uh, frequency combs that enable to basically sleep light and then manipulate it. So it's a, it's a combination as always. Okay. And in terms of talent uh, and startups like operating, trying to build in the space, where are you seeing those coming from? We are both in Singapore. I and... would <laughs> love to say yes, but in photonics, surprisingly, I've even before, before this podcast, I did a, I did a quick research um, and uh, uh, obviously there are uh, research centers like in US, ASTAR, which do a lot in, for example, silicon photonics. Um, but I wouldn't say that there are a lot of, first of all, photonic startups in Singapore. At least I haven't seen many of them in comparison to Europe or the US. And in, in, in Asia in general, uh, excluding China, because China is a different universe. They have quite a lot of interesting startups there. In, in, even in objects like their quantum computer, Zhou Zhang, from um, uh, university in, in uh, Hefei, uh, is, is using for optical uh, technology. But um, obviously Japan is also quite strong with MCT and Sony and other players like University of Tokyo, for example, is quite prominent in this space. But it's still a fraction of what we see in Europe and and the US, especially Europe. Surprisingly, um, there, there is even a, a rating of the most prominent researchers in photonics. Um, research, researchers which have like the, some commercial applications, like uh, uh, including like uh, startup co-founders. And like, for example, one of the co-founder of uh, Lumai was recently included into this list. He's from Oxford. And we see that I think 30 out of 130 people were from the US. One was from Japan, one was from Australia, and the rest is Europe. So it's being Germany, France, UK, and then like across the continental Europe. So it's still, it's still Europe. Um, that's why we, although we are very interested in uh, APAC, but in Photonics specifically, Europe is still a very interesting space in terms of talent, both on the scientific and engineering side of things. Um, but yeah, still, I think in, in Asia, in APAC, in uh, countries like Singapore, Japan, from time to time, we see some teams which do something similar, but maybe not that revolutionary. Like, for example, photonic chips. I've seen several startups. I even talked recently to a startup from Indonesia which does photonic uh, technology from related to photonic chips. But it's still a fraction of what we see in Europe. In terms of the background of a lot of founders, right? I, I find feel like they have semiconductor sort of background or they are physicists. Um, Would you agree? Not necessarily. Like, for example, um, the founders of Lumai, like Sensing Goa, the co-founder of Lumai, who studied in uh, Oxford, he has the background in quantum physics and optics. So it's more on optics side of things rather than semiconductors. Sometimes if it's uh, related to um, some applications in CMOS architecture, then of course, there are also people with semiconductor background. But I, I would say it's both, not necessarily depending on the, uh, like for data centers, for example, like optical transceivers, they do not have like direct correlation with uh, semiconductors. Okay. And uh, yeah, le le let's talk about quantum computing in comparison to optical computing, right? So you mentioned uh, the use cases for quantum computing is specific, but scaling is a problem so far. And also maintaining the coherence of the quantum qubits is, is, has been a problem for a long time. But if there is a breakthrough, then it can really solve complex problems like cryptography and, and yeah, uh, a lot of these co uh, complex issues, right? So, uh, but in comparison to that, to that, optical computing, it increases the speed 
and also the power efficiency and the applications is more uh, widespread so i was listening to this uh, interview with mm-hmm. this light matter ceo right he, he was saying that maybe we don't need quantum computing at all because uh, deep learning has been able to kind of mimic very complex problem solving so let's say we can achieve the speed and the efficiency and combine that with deep learning the existing deep learning sort of breakthroughs that we already have maybe we don't need quantum computing would you agree with such a statement mm-hmm. i would probably not agree with this because we can have both actually it it doesn't hurt having both of it um and uh, uh there is uh, something that you can do with deep learning but then there is just way much more than you can do with quantum sensing for example in i think one of the applications that comes to my mind is in mining i think saudi aramco is one of the companies i think someone who is working with them on the by helping saudi aramco to um better analyze the uh, mineral reserves using deep learning um by basically projecting like what they found the data they really have and trying to extrapolate what they would found or if they drill like a few a few miles a few meter a few hundred meters deeper very uh, simplified but that's basically the the principle while quantum sensors for example which is again it's not quantum computer it's just it's a um, but it sensors using quantum mechanics they can solve the problem that and they, they can create the whole 3d map of the reserves with extremely with a way higher precision and get the data like the 100 times more or 100 times more precise data that Saudi Aramco would have with the, with the current sensors and the current technology exploration technology and then they can apply ai on on top of this and even uh, improve this data so i don't think it's first of all it's not it's not irrepla- um, interreplaceable it, it's basically quite complementary and there are different there are different applications yeah. as i said the quantum sensors is one of them and um, there are a lot of applications for quantum sensors but then you have quantum computers quantum computers are so uh, helping to solve extremely sophisticated optimization problems which is a different thing that you may th- think about um for example optimizing the load in the microgrids which are distributed using solar panels windmills ev charging stations different like uh, different connectors and the quantum computer computing may solve this because the biggest problem like in the in uh, grid in power grids is that the sources of energy and the sources of demand are becoming increasingly unpredictable and unstable like 50 years ago you would have like a single power station working on coal and then you have like a, a high voltage line connecting this power station with a big city where you have all the major consuming substations and that's it that we don't need quantum computer for this but if you have a distributed network with all the different re- renewable sources which are uh changing according to the weather which is quite hard to predict unless you have quantum computer by the way that's another uh use case that I, I could talk about later a bit later but um that's where you would need quantum computer because it's really hard to simulate um the um, what's going on inside the system same for drug discovery for example uh simulating how a single molecule would um behave in different environments with different effects um with different in different conditions um it, it's just it, now it's taking years for drug discovery companies to simulate it and to do the r&d research to do testing with quantum computers those companies can do testing way faster or material science basically very similar um use case to drug discovery um, 
one of our quantum computing companies, Pascal, uh, which is a French um, quantum computing developer, they use called Atoms as a, as a tech stack. They have quite a few different use cases with corporates already, and they, they have revenue. So it's, a, it's one, of the, uh, one of the fewest quantum computing companies that already has some commercial traction because it sh and this case actually shows to a higher extent how many corporates are really trying to understand the, all the use cases and trying to experiment with all these use cases and they're ready even to buy those quantum computers or connect to quantum computers and pay for the um, load of using them. And I think this area is still is a huge area. And they're still, like when I said, there are specific use cases, there's still a lot of them. Quantum can solve many of these problems. So I think in this case, I wouldn't probably agree that um, AI can make uh, quantum computer re uh, computing redundant. No, it will basically be complementary. And there is just way much more problems that AI will not solve or will not solve as good as quantum computer. Okay. I think one thing that we did not talk about is the challenges of optical computing. Is that uh, got to do with just manipulating and controlling light? There are different challenges. There are challenges um, in terms of uh, also integrating it with the traditional CMOS architecture. That's for silicon photonics, for example. Um, like optical transceivers, optical processors also have their own challenges that um, I think it's too technical to kind of mention all of them, but in general, kind of saying it that it's still quite early stage in terms of the like how would you integrate such processor, for example, in your data center infrastructure? Like how would you integrate it with your classical architecture? That's something that is more like an engineering problem rather than a scientific problem, but it needs to be done. It, it just takes time. It just takes time to test it, to experiment, to find the, the right configurations. But I think this is one of the major, and then another challenge that I think also mentioned that the architectures are just extremely sophisticated for photonics, just because we've been dealing with CMOS and semiconductor like silicon based architectures for many, many years before it's become like a state of the art technology. For photonics, it will probably also take, it's already taking quite a few times as you fairly mentioned, like the first, the first silicon photonics were in, a, in a, I think, started to develop like in the, in the 80s and we've seen the first applications like in the 2000s but uh, still it will take some time but I think we think that now actually it's um, very close to implementation and to commercial traction like for optical processors for AI it will take like several years actually it's way it will it will happen way sooner than quantum than the real quantum revolution so we think that that's one of the attractive aspects of photonics in general. And uh, from an investment perspective, uh, are you seeing enough opportunities? That's one. <laughs> Second thing is, where are you seeing those opportunities in the specific op optical mm. computing space? In, well, first of all, also a small disclaimer, I'm not sourcing most of our companies in uh, Europe, I'm looking at what we have in Asia, which is uh, so far not that many. Um, but in Europe, from what I see from um, my teammates, we uh, actually see quite a lot of them. Photonics is still is, is a niche uh, segment um, because, oh, because there are just not that many um, specialists, not that many scientists in photonics, and you cannot scale them as fast as like Web3 developers, for example. That's why, although the demand is growing really fast, but the supply of uh, talent is quite limited and quite niche. And that's why there's still the number of like maybe 10 to 20 
pro uh, really good projects that we've seen in Europe um, and probably the same number in the US. I may be, I may be mistaken again, because we have special people who are uh, looking at this space in Europe and US, but it's like, it's not, it's not huge number of opportunities just because uh, there are not that many teams who work on this. Yeah. And in terms of, so what would be like the, the business model for some of these startups, like it's just like a lot of them, for example, light matter, uh, they, they are, um, building for cloud infrastructure, right? So, um, it's hard to say because it's very early, at least for the companies that we invest in, in photonics. Um, they're trying to figure out, um, so they, they pretty much pr probably what they figure out already is the, the profile of customers, but they're trying to figure out how they would fit it into their ecosystem uh, infrastructure and who would be like, what would be the go to market strategy as well. So this is something that is still under development because for like, if we don't talk about just photonic chips, which as you mentioned, is already quite established um, area, although very limited. They are, I think business model are very simple. Just you, you supply chips to um, other semiconductor providers or to um, cloud providers like AWS, et cetera, to manufacturers of uh, optical equipment or equipment just for data centers and try to integrate into the solutions. I may probably just guess or kind of forecast that the new wave of optical com computing startups will have similar approach, at least for AI, like for analog computing. For digital computing, it's, again, it's very early. It's just um, too early to say what would be the exact like what would be the exact sales channels, how they would, like, would it be, I don't know, subscription or would they uh, integrate their solution into uh, like uh, existing supply chains? But I think it would be quite similar to, uh, it may be projected to, the, to what we kind of see in, in the classic computing world. Yeah, but, but surely uh, if it works, then it would be highly profitable uh, scalable solutions that fit right into the VC sort of investments. That's model, what, right? Yeah, that's what we think it will be. Hopefully, it will um, fulfill its promise uh, because the um, uh, because the size of the problem is just very huge. And essentially, um, for most of the such companies, the exit strategy is not really like creating a sustainable business, reaching profitability, like shipping uh, millions of chips, um, at least not for early stage VC investors. Like for us, we, we invest in companies at like at seed stage when they valued at like slightly less than $10 million. Uh, and for us, having substantial return would be already enough if the company reaches like a billion or two billion dollar valuation um, and for many uh, for many uh, companies the strat strategic acquisition would be a more probable scenario because they are developing technologies that are kind of threat threatening the not ex okay not existing <laughs> Existing. Yeah, I, I don't want. I, I, I don't want Big to say existence, but they're threatening uh, or disrupting the areas that are traditional. That traditional, the current leading players are working on, like Nvidia, for example, with G with GPUs for AI, like Lumai, developing new generation technology for for the same use case, or like our first quantum investment that we did in 2013, ID Quantique they basically disrupted like they uh, they did quantum communication devices and they just started to disrupt the telecommunication uh industry and they got acquired by south korea telecom because it, it was just a threat for, them, for, for the company um and this is i think 
the most probable scenarios. And some of those exits, you may think, of course, of Microsoft acquiring uh, OpenAI for uh, $10 billion. Uh, but also another interesting uh, example of Zilinx, which was doing basically high performance computing infrastructure. It was acquired by AMD for, I think, 40, $47 billion. So uh, the, depending on the size of the problem and on the maturity of the technology, you, the exits, the acquisitions can be very, very large. And uh, um, you, don't, you don't necessarily need to wait till the company kind of really becomes profitable and uh, builds like a traditional business, like traditional SaaS business. So that's, I think that one of the most probable scenarios for most of such really deep tech companies, startups, for example, in optical computing and quantum computing spaces. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I think this is true across a lot of other, other tech as well, like uh, self-driving cruise, which sold to GM and then <laughs> that was the exit. Yeah. It, it took like another seven years or something <laughs> for them to commercialize. Some technologies already po uh, pose a threat as soon as you realize that they may work or e if they work, like if they prove to be working, then you just extrapolate what will happen next. And if you are really smart enough, then <laughs> you may probably think that, okay, now it's better to stop it now and be part of this process or just to, um, yeah, try to integrate it into, into our inf infrastructure rather than creating a way till the competitor is created. Because in this case, your competitors may invest in this company and they can benefit from it. So yeah, in deep tech, that's the most probable scenario usually. Yeah, uh, this was great, uh, Dennis. Uh, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to thank do you, this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul, for having me. And uh, yeah, hopefully it was helpful and insightful. Happy. Uh, looking forward to a new podcast as well.